Hi, it's Rob from Online Video Solutions and welcome to the Sony PXW X180 pros and cons review. This will follow the similar format to the X70 and the X200 reviews I've done recently. We are look through what I consider the pros and the cons of this camera in its working environment. Often things that you might not find in the manual that isn't talked about in the marketing and the literature and often isn't covered in many other reviews that I've seen of these cameras. And we use them particularly in eight and nine hour seminars and, and live events. We also live stream with them. We have multi cameras that are used with switching equipment uh, and we do testimonials and interviews as well. So that's kind of how I've come across these pros and cons. So let's get straight into it with the uh, pros of this particular camera. And the number one pro I feel is the 25 times zoom lens on the X180. Here's an example. You can see the optics inside the 25 times zoom lens and the uh, three times third inch chips at the back there. Probably the reason why the lens is quite fat and um, you can see how much optics is involved and certainly one of the longest zoom lenses for a handheld camera that I'm aware of. Here you can see a comparison with the X200 that we have. It's slightly wider at the wide angle, which is interesting. And as we zoom all the way in there, you can see the difference. There's definitely, it may not be as much in the view that you can see there, but that's a noticeable difference in the zoom length. Um, although you can see the X200 obviously is superior in low light. The lens zoom ramping from f1.6 to 2.4 is pretty good, especially compared to its competitors, the um, Panasonic 270 and uh, the JVC 650. In the top left hand corner there, you can see the f iris of 2.4 to 1.6. So as you zoom through the range, there's obviously a stepping up as you zoom in. But again, compared to its, the other com uh, cameras at the um, same sort of price range and, and feature set, uh, this certainly has a better uh, zoom ramping than its competitors. The X180 also comes with waveform and vector scope. Here we can see that on the right hand side here you can see a small version of the waveform come up and you can see me moving the iris here just to show you what the waveform is like. Um, very useful to obviously gauge exposure either for skin tones or overall picture. A press of the assign button gives you the vector scope which is a little bit small and the histogram and then another press takes you back to not having anything over there. Uh, so very useful to have on an assignable button as well, so quick and easy to use and something I would hope that are more professional cameras and unfortunately is not on the X200. And you'll hear a lot of me talking about the X180 compared to the X200 since we have both of them. It's often useful to compare them between the two, particularly if you're looking at one of these two cameras. The X180 has a 1080p 50 or 60 or 50i or 60i output, particularly when recording in 50p. So let's have a look at that. Right, so if we go into the menu here, we can see that at the moment we're set to 1920 by 1080, 25p at 50 megabits on the XAVCL long gop format. So if we go in now and we change this to 1920, 1080, 50p at 50 megabits, and we execute this, what will happen if you have an external recorder connected via HDMI is that you'll lose the signal to the external recorder on HDMI. And the reason for this is if we go into the menu here and go all the way out up to video, we need to look at the output format. So if we touch on the output format here, we can see that by default, as soon as you change to 1080p 50 or 60, the camera defaults to level B output on the SDI and there's no level B output on HDMI, hence the black screen. So what we need to do to enable HDMI 50p or 60p output is to actually go up and select level A, go all the way down, and then hit set. And essentially that will now allow a 1080p 50 or 60 signal out of the HDMI port on the X180. The other benefit, of course, is if we go back in there, you can actually select 1080i as well. So if you want to record 1080p 50 internally, but have this connected to, for example, some kind of switching equipment or broadcast equipment that often takes the um, 50i or 60i signal, then the camera has this option. One of the few cameras I've seen that gives you the option of outputting either 50p or 50i when the camera is recording 50p internally. So very, very nice to have that feature, but also just be aware of losing the HDMI initially when you switch over to 50p if you are using the HDMI output. So you have to swap that to level A as shown above. 
The AC power location on the camera is useful, again compared to the X200, there it is in the bottom right hand corner, separate from the battery compartment. Amazingly enough the X200 has the um, power placement inside the battery compartment, so you have to remove the battery in order to power the camera through the AC. And obviously with the X180 as you can see here, um, it's completely separate and a very sensible place to put the power uh, adapter or placement on the X180. The X180 also comes with a separate battery charger. So here we can see what comes in the box. Top left is the um, power brick that actually powers the X180 and bottom right is the standard power slash charger for the batteries that the X200, X180 and that uh, range of cameras use. Interesting in the manual they do say use the power brick on the top left to power the camera rather than the power charger combination at the bottom. So you power it with the top left and you charge the battery with the um, charger DC out uh, unit at the bottom. Sony obviously comes with the um, MI shoe now on the X70, X200, X180 and again here you can see it fully compatible with all cold shoe mounts um, but you can see the pins there and that obviously allows uh, items such as this unit which is the Sony receiver sitting on top of the Sony SMAD P3 MI shoe adapter and with that installed like that you basically have power to the receiver as well as audio. So this is wonderful for us that run seven or eight hour or nine hour days. Once it's plugged in and the camera is powered it'll draw the power from the camera and it'll send the audio so no cables required. All I have to think about is the uh, transmitter on the speakers rather than having to change batteries on the receiver. So very very useful from the MI shoe point of view particularly with the um, audio receiver. The Sony X180 also has an MI shoe audio switch externally so here we can see that. On the side there you have internal mic, external for the XLR and MI shoe so you can swap either of the channels to any one of those three options. Comparing that to the X200, the, the X200 you need to go into the menu to enable or, or disable the MI shoe option. Here obviously you can do so externally on the camera body which is the much preferred option. Wireless functionality on the X180 is a lot better than on the X200. Okay, let's have a look now at the uh, Wi-Fi or network options of the PXW X180. If we go into the menu here and we go all the way down to system and then we go down to network. You can see how long the menu takes to activate. So here we've got the menu or the uh, network active, should I say. And there's four options. Wi-Fi access point means the X180 is actually the transmitter. The Wi-Fi station means it can it can connect to an existing Wi-Fi network. A modem is if you have a USB to Ethernet adapter and obviously off switches the network off. So we're going to leave it on Wi-Fi access meaning that the X180 will now transmit a signal and I'll connect to that with my Apple iPad. We can also have a look here. It does do WPS which is an automatic type of connection with an existing LAN system um, and it has various other settings under there. So let's now switch over to the iPad. So if we look at the iPad now and we go in, there we can see the Direct Connect. I have made this connection before so I won't have to input the password. I'll simply tap on the Direct 180. I'll then go out of that and into Content Browser Mobile. I'll do a search here now. There we go, there's the option. I'll tap on it. Now once it's gone sort of yellow-orange, now I know it's connected. So if I go into the option and I choose Monitoring here, and I go out of the menu on the actual camera itself and open the hood. There you'll see, you can actually see the wall. Everything is being monitored perfectly. If I close this again and I tap on the top right there, you can see the various options. There's the camera with some of its controls. You can control iris, focus, zoom and automatic white balance. And under playback, you can obviously play back everything as well as proxy. You can stop and start uh, proxy recording. So that's very useful under monitoring. If we go to browse, if we had some um, recorded files here, we'd see that on either the SD card or one of the slots. We don't have anything recorded at the moment. And under local, if I'd uploaded to the iPad itself, I would see some kind of uh, video clips here. Planning metadata is, is quite useful. Um, you can actually go into it, set up uh, metadata information like this, and, and then upload to the camera itself. However, I have to say that I don't see the option in the bottom left hand corner it should have the word upload but I'm not sure here how to actually upload this to the X180 there doesn't seem to be a way to actually transfer this. When I did the same test with the X200 down in the bottom left hand corner 
there was a button that said load and I was able to upload wirelessly the metadata as you can see there it was set up for the X200. I could automatically send that to the X200. I'm not sure on the X180 how to actually do that because there's no option here to actually load this data. And if we go back out here all the way, you can see that there's no other option to choose where to actually send it to either. So a little bit of a question mark around the planning of metadata, sending the metadata wirelessly to the X180. Under the job list, if you had, again, files that you wanted to upload or download, that would show you. Uh, and under application, again, it would show you both the download and upload of any files that you had ready to go, either to an iPad or to the Sony CI um, cloud service. Under settings here, if we go into settings, again, we can see the same as the X200, which has the monitoring. You only have three options under monitoring there. That's the size of the monitoring. In other words, how high a quality monitor we can do with the X180 straight to the iPad. You can also do streaming and you can set up and, and edit the presets of, of the um, streaming itself. So if we begin, go in there, we can choose from the di different options for the type as well as the size of streaming as well, as well as the bitrate. If we go to proxy format, again, you can choose the size of the proxy. It will take the uh, frame rate and bitrate directly because that is already set so for example if you look at the menu there you can choose either 9, 3, 1 or 0 0.5 depending on the resolution but the frame rate will always stay the same. Under station settings this is quite useful because here you can actually set up an SSID that is non-WPS in other words how do you get the X180 to connect for example to an Apple Extreme or an Apple Time Machine or anything that doesn't transmit the WPS type integrated setup system. Well here you can do that, you can set up the SSID and the key, you can then send that to the X180, you can then set the X180s to station mode and then you can make a connection with any wireless um, LAN network. And then under status itself it just tells you the little bit of the um, network status there. So quite useful from a um, network setting, you do have some control over the X180, useful if again you're going to be using this in some form. Staying on the network of the X180, it's really good compared to the X200, its bigger brother. If we go into the menu here and we go all the way down, we can go to system here. And if we look under rec format, we can see that we can enable 1920 by 1080 at 50p or 60p if you are an NTSC person. Um, and you can actually have the network on at the same time. This is impossible on the X200. As moment you start the network on the X200, it disables 1080p 50 and 60 and you cannot output 1080p 50 or 60 on the X200. So if you're looking for the network options, be very careful of using the X200. Whereas the X180, as we can see, we go all the way out of the menu and you can see in the top right corner there, we have 1920 by 1080 at 50p and a little bit further down you see the AP, which is the access point. So you can have network and 1080p 50 and 60 running on the X180, which is really good. Also, if we go out here and we go up a little bit further up here to the video options, you can see there your output on off. We're sending the output on both SDI and HDMI. And if we go to the output format here, here we can see that you can choose level A or B, so that's 1080p 50 in level A or level B, and you can also use 1920 by 1080 50i. So you've got a selection there on the X180 from the SDI and HDMI um, in terms of the output. Obviously you can see there under the HDMI you can't output level B, but you can output 50p or 50i while the camera is recording 50p internally. So really the feature set on this with the Wi-Fi enabled is really good, particularly compared to the X200, which are currently on firmware version 2, both the cameras, um, the network functionality versus the 50p recording on the X200 is really crippled. So if you're looking for 50p recording and you want to run a network option, 1080p 50 or 60, then you definitely want to be looking at the X180 for that. Switching the network on and off does not require a reboot. The reason I put this in as a pro on the X180 is if we have a look here, you can see the access point option on the uh, screen itself here, the little AP, uh, that denotes the access point is active. But the reason I put this in is because compared to the X200, every time you switch the camera off on the X200, it reboots the camera. And so you're looking at sort of 20 seconds, whereas here, if we go into the menus here on the um, network, 
we can see that we've got similar options to the X200, the access point station modem and off. And when we switch it off and we go out of the menu here, you can see the little AP has disappeared in the far right hand side there, but the camera doesn't restart. So you can switch the network on and off, put the access point on again here, go out and you'll see it uh, start to flash there. So actually switching the network on and off on the X180 is very quick. It still does take some time with the AP flashing until it picks up the IP address and then broadcasts the signal. But certainly the whole process is a lot quicker than the X200. The X180 is a really good quality LCD screen. Here you can see it's just sharp, clear, a really good screen. Particularly when we open up um, the hood, you can see they're really useful. Again, and I compare this to the X200, the text on the X200 is just sort of sharp and blocky almost, whereas here it's very smooth and just looks good to the eye. The X180 also has a really good EVF. Again, I compare this to the X200. Here was me trying to put the uh, PM, uh, the GH4 right into the EVF to give you some kind of view of what it might look like. Obviously, you can't quite fit it in, in, in its entirety, but I can assure you that the EVF is a lot better on the X180 than the X200. And you also have the little eye sensor on the X180 as well. So as you bring your eye close to the EVF, it'll switch on. As you move it away, it switches off. So very useful if you're out in bright light. And my colleague over in the US uses this a lot. The X180 has seven assignable buttons. Here you can see six of them on the side there. Four of them are already assigned, but they can be completely reassigned. You can also see the little nipple on the two middle buttons there and then the sort of raised... Uh, lip around the uh, top middle button so that eventually when if you use this a lot you'll get used to it by touch and you won't need to look at pushing those buttons you can feel them your fingers will get used to them you'll know which buttons you're on just by the way Sony set those uh, six buttons up. Here's the seventh assignable button on the uh, grip itself and uh, unfortunately they only make it for the uh, focus magnifier it's a shame they didn't also include that for the rec review which is actually easier to reach when you're hand holding this camera but a good number of seven assignable buttons with a good number of features that you can reassign. So very useful from that point of view. The X180 also has a hard stop manual focus ring. As we have a look here, you can see that uh, in manual mode with the ring pulled back, you could go to the hard stop both infinity and at 0 0.8, which again, very useful. As you push it forward, of course, it goes into autofocus um, and it'll just uh, rotate endlessly. So very easy to pull backwards and forwards and also very nice with the grip. The way Sony have put the new grip on there, those little teeth on the grip are certainly better than the old um, X, uh, EX1 and EX1R. The X180 has a headphone channel switch. Again, a small thing on the very back there. You can see that by simply flipping a switch, you can listen only to channel one, listen to both channels or channel two. Compared to the X200, you have to go into the menu and make those changes, which again is very slow and just cumbersome much easier on the X180. The X180 also has a standard LANC remote. Again, I compare this to the X200, which has this sort of very unique six or eight pin remote that can't be used on any other camera. Here, this is a standard 2.5 millimeter remote that's very compatible with, for example, Canon or Panasonic or a JVC. So useful if the camera has a, a, a LANC remote that's compatible with other cameras. It just means you can move your remote around. Peaking on focus mag, if we have a look here in the menu on the X180, if we go down to LCD VF and we go down to peaking, there's two options under peaking, which again is very useful. The X180 only has color peaking. Sorry, the X200 only has color peaking. The X180 has both normal, which gives it the sort of silvery shine, which does make it easier to see, or color. I'll show it to you with color here just so that it's easier for you to see. So that's the normal screen. And as we punch in with focus mag, we can see there that peaking remains on, which is very useful. So if you are looking to obviously focus accurately, it is useful if you can have peaking on, whether it's color or normal, um, with a focus mag included. Focus mag stays zoomed until you press a button. Again, here we can see the normal picture. As we press focus mag, it goes in, the peaking remains, and so does focus mag until you press the button. I compare this again with the X200 where you press the focus mag. If you don't touch it again, after five seconds, it reverts back to the normal screen. With the X180, focus mag stays include, um, zoomed in, shall I say, or stays enabled. And um, the good thing is it doesn't get recorded internally on the camera. So when you, have, when you are checking focus, if you are recording internally, it'll only record the normal view like this. 
the X180 has what I consider a better shotgun mic holder position. Here's a comparison between the X180 and the X200. The X180 is on the left, the X200 is on the right. If you look closely, you can see that the uh, shotgun mic on the X180 on the left hand side is, is lower. So it's a lot easier when you put this into cases. Um, it's not pushing against the um, shotgun mic, whereas with the X200, I find we've got to push the X200 very low. And on the, in one of the cases that we carry it on our back, we actually have to take the um, shotgun mic off there because it just protrudes too high. So it's a shame that the X200 doesn't have a similar way of positioning the um, shotgun mic where the, the mic itself is much lower to the top of the camera. There you can see a close-up view. This is certainly, in my view, a better constructed shotgun mic, certainly from a positional point of view, than the X200, which is this one, which really stands far too high when you have to pack the camera away. Probably something that the um, engineers didn't really think that much about. The X180 also has two times quarter inch screw threads, a small thing, but Going back to the X1, the X1R, they only had a single screw thread, which obviously means the camera could easily uh, rotate on the tripod. Uh, here, when you lock on a plate, it really is locked and the camera will stay dead still. So very useful to have two quarter inch uh, screw threads. Moving on to the cons now on the X180. Probably one of the biggest ones is the sluggish menu response. If you at all use the menu a lot, you will see. I'm going to give you some example as best I can here. Um, but it's only once you start to use it you'll recognize how slow the menu is using the menu dial. Uh, when you go in here, here you can see how long it takes for a menu to come up. The X180 is, is really big and heavy at 3.4 kilos, more or less 3.34 kilos with its extras. And by extras I mean having the tripod plate on there uh, and the battery. So here you can see what the camera looks like. Weighed here taken straight off the tripod this would weigh three, just under 3.4 kilograms, which is very big and heavy compared to its um, competitor or its brother, the X200, which is only 2.87 kilos. So if you're hand holding this, like my colleague uh, Paul is in the US, you certainly, it'll give you a lot more of a workout than uh, the X200. And that's probably due to the size of the lens and the zoom range, but certainly a lot bigger, fatter, chunkier camera uh, than the X200. The zoom ring is not coupled to the zoom rocker. So let's just have a look here. You can see here as I press on the zoom rocker, um, the camera will zoom in. You may hopefully see that just on the side there on the LCD. But you can see that the zoom rocker with a little uh, sort of knob there on the outside is not moving at all. So it's decoupled from that. Whereas the X180, they, they work in tandem. The moment you press the rocker, you can actually see the zoom ring turn, which I prefer, it just gives it a more accurate feel. So this certainly seems to be like a fly-by-wire type system where the, the ring and the rocker are, are decoupled from each other. Um, and I definitely prefer the X200's rocker and zoom ring, which are sort of in sync, so to speak. There is manual zoom lag. And if you're somebody who does crash zooms, you will not like this. Watch what happens here. You can see how long it takes if, you, if you're pressing it or if you're zooming in fast. So if you're doing the crash type of zooms, you can see there's a significant lag. Um, but if you move it slowly, which I'll do now, you can see that there it sort of keeps track or keeps up. But as soon as you start to crash zoom in and out, and the camera lags massively behind. Again, I'm guessing that's because of the sort of fly-by-wire electronic system as opposed to a proper servo zoom ring. The steady shot has multiple button presses. Again, this is from my colleague Paul, um, who uses the steady shot a lot. If you see over here, we go into the menu, you'll be able to see that you can actually assign a button to the steady shot, which in and of itself is quite useful um, because obviously there, there isn't a button on the lens itself, which the X200 does have. And there you can see we've set up um, button number one, a steady shot. And now if we go out here and we start to press the button, you'll see on the left hand side where it says off just above MF there. Then it goes on, which is a standard. And there, here's your active steady shot. So you have to press the button three times to swap between them. It would have been nice if you could select in the menu, I either want active or I only want steady shot. And then a button press could work like that. Uh, my colleague Paul also says that the active steady shot isn't as good as the standard steady shot. Uh, particularly when you zoomed in, you get this sort of jittering effect. The X180 only has a single picture profile. So if we look at the menu here, um, we go down to the paint option. And while it does have many of the same functions in terms of what you can change for um, the picture profile, 
there is only this one setting so you can't copy between them whereas the X200 has a more professional set of six picture profiles where you can copy between the picture profiles um, you can save all or some of them here you can make one save to an SD card but you can't swap or change them as easily as you can on the X200 so definitely the paint menu is a step backwards compared to the X200. The X180 has a difficult to reach focus mag button I did allude to this earlier, so here if you're holding the camera you can see the focus mag is right there just behind the zoom rocker uh, and really it's a lot easier to reach the rec record than it is the focus mag button because as you can see there where my index finger is it's just hindered a little bit by the way it's designed with that sort of curved edge there um, it just doesn't make it so easy to reach the focus mag so it's a shame that the rec record isn't reassignable because that would be easier to use. The X180 has what I consider average low light performance and really I'm maybe being a little bit strict here but if we compare it here's a shot of the X180 on the left and the X200 on the right I'm shooting this into a fairly dark room as you can see and here's the shot so this is the X180 at 0 dB zoomed in here's the comparison with the X200 these are both at uh, 0 dB here is the X180 at 6 dB here's the X200 at 6 dB the X180 at 12 dB, the X200 at 12 dB, the X180 at 18 dB, its highest, and the X200 at 18 dB. So you can see there's a noticeable difference. And here again, I've given you side by side with the X180 on the right and the X200 on the left. So that's zero. There's 6 dB. There's 12 dB on both cameras and 18 dB. So obviously the X200. Uh, is considerably better in low light. The X180 has these annoying warning banners that appear on the LCD and here you can see what I mean when you go and make certain changes for example here you push the iris too high you get this highlight banner button coming up really you know this is a professional camera Sony we don't need to be told what's going on on the screen we really can see it when you change any other functions here you get these big banners appearing on the screen really there should be a, a menu option that allows us to disable banner warnings because it's particularly frustrating if you're making changes and these uh, banner warnings keep appearing. We don't need this Sony, we are professionals hopefully, we know what we're doing. So that's it, thanks so much for watching this review. There's a link to the PXW X180 uh, link on Sony's website. If you have any comments please leave those, I'll be happy to answer them and hopefully as I say this has been useful for you in deciding whether this is the camera for you.